Hi, everyone. Nice to finally, finally meet you in person. Um, now I'm a little nervous, um, but it's really, I'm really happy to be here and to talk about a little bit about from monitoring to observability, left shift your SLOs with chaos today. I'm Michael. Um, I'm a senior developer evangelist at GitLab. On the internet, you can find me as DNS Michi, which is DNS M I C H I. It's the lovely form of Michael in German, and I figured later on it doesn't really work in English. Um, but please connect if you want to. And now let's dive into and start with like an SR retail. And let's build some Lego as well. Um, a while ago, well, like 10 years ago, we had certain things like black box monitoring, state changes, measuring SLA, SLA reporting over time. At a certain point, metrics have been added, um, trending, service level objective have, have been defined, and we moved into certain things like white box monitoring. And one of the things which inspired me in my past life as an open source monitoring maintainer myself, the Prometheus metrics endpoint was added to Docker and it made it much more easy and convenient to look inside the application. From there, like we defined service level agreements, objectives, indicators, there was much to learn and much to move on like saying, hey, I want to have an availability of 99.5%. The objective is much higher, and we also need to define an indicator and the error budgets, actually, which we want to um, look at and see whether the SLO is actually violated. And there are many terms to also consider and figure out, like the golden signals, which help you immediately identify specific things which are going wrong, for example, in your Kubernetes cluster, or in your environment, something like latency, traffic, errors, and saturation. At a certain point, you needed to instrument the code, like making a code change to really export the metrics you wanted to see. Um, the term, or site reliability engineering, SRE, was invented, and maybe it solved everything, maybe not. But in the end, it was really a nice way to move forward and go into the metrics direction. As a developer, on the other side, um, something goes wrong, you make a mistake, there is a bug, and one of the stories I want to tell today is we had sort of a monitoring system with a central server, satellites, a REST API, JSON RPC, and it was not that fast. And we thought, of, well, let's just add more threads to it. Problem was then the CPU was locked, and maybe we should do something else. The application was written in C++, we looked at Go at the time, and thought, well, let's use Go teams. And we found a library um, which implements coroutines in C++. It was stackless, um, putting the function pointer on the heap, and then there was stack unwinding with continuation. And it was pretty complex, um, but we were confident that this would solve our problems. Well, in, in reality, um, works on my machine doesn't mean um, that it's like working in, in a large scale environment. And there was a crash happening, but only with a, th a thousand API clients. There was memory corruption. Sometimes it was exhausted, so maybe a leak or something like that. And it behaved differently on operating systems, like on Windows, there were stack guards, which caused a crash. And uh, when there was a security scanner running, it was a different crash. And this was super hard to debug, and to be honest, it burned me out in 2019. Um, and I thought, well, oops, maybe we could do something else about this, or how would this have been looked if I would have known about metrics and SLOs before? So like defining that the heap memory shouldn't, uh, should meet the ops requirements. We are defining the service level indicator as the mem usage level, for example, and the SLO shouldn't be like increasing by 10% or another arbitrary number. Meaning to say, whenever I'm doing a change in my software and it reaches a merge request, um, CI CD deploys that, I can measure that and get immediate feedback and never hits production or with continuous delivery deploying in production but immediately doing a rollback when detected. Um, and on the other side, I was like, mm, maybe the, the API clients and the connections could have used something like chaos engineering or fussing or something else to really like figure out if the problem is being hit. Now. Another thing is like thinking about switching roles into ops. Um, and my nickname is DNS Mihi, um, and I'm saying it's always DNS. It's probably true. 
I was working um, at the University of Vienna back then, and there was a rollout with the .at domain with the NSSEC. We had a signing hardware. We had a state machine of steps. On a Friday afternoon, a script was changed. It was deployed to production. The signing stopped. No DNS updates. So whenever you register the .at domain, nothing happened. Um, monitoring was in place, which meant like we did monitor things. We had the serial and the offset defined. Um, the first alarm came, I think, on Saturday at 3 a.m. in the morning via email. So I wasn't reading that. But at 4 a.m., there was a flood of SMS messages, text messages. From all the na name servers involved, I think there were 25 at the time. Every minute, 25 SMS is not fun. And like after the uh, fifth or whatever alarm, um, it wasn't really fun, like logging into terminal and trying to figure out what is going wrong. Um, we've, we later learned um, that the change was persisted in Git. It was rolled into production, but back at the time, we didn't really have CI, CD, or quality gates or something else. So the idea was to say maybe as a retrospective now, thinking of having a staging environment, having everything rolled with GitOps or infrastructure as code persisted in Git and verified this, that the changes are being tested um, and that, uh, that no other things are going wrong. The SLI, for example, could be the zone serial age. The SLO is a certain way of um, saying, hey, the zone should be not much older than one hour. And I thought of, well, chaos engineering, maybe intercepting DNS traffic, denying zone updates, doing specific things which just do things which software doesn't expect, and maybe, maybe make the improvements in that direction. Another story, switching gears from dev to ops to DevOps, like we are using, we're used to using containers, and one of the things which happened in, I think it was in September 2020 when Docker announced hub, uh, for Docker Hub the rate limits, and we didn't know what is happening. Is my CI CD pipeline not working because I cannot pull the containers? What about cloud native deployments, rolling out your application in Kubernetes? The, the left hand side or the, the first container works and the second doesn't, what, what, is, what is going on? And similar to like when it's based on an IP address, what, what happens to organizations using a NAT or bigger cloud providers and whatnot. So, well, we had a certain known state. We saw that there was an API with or response headers with limits, simulating a pull, um, got a header re response, passed something, and back then um, we also wrote a Prometheus exporter to being able to monitor that qu quickly. Um, this was solvable. The unknown state was like, well, Maybe there is something in the logs. Maybe there is something else which tells me too many requests, but I need to like dig deep down into a CI/CD pipeline interface or specific um, anywhere else. And the problem which could have occurred is like the application or the shop is presenting um, a specific price, but to only a third of your customers, and they say, "Well, it's awesome, it's on sale," but actually, um, it. Um, oh, sorry, no. those who are seeing the new price, um, they think, well, it's too expensive. And the other ones are saying, oh, it's actually cheap and I'm buying and then you really need to grant the price. And actually it was just because you couldn't pull the container in, the, in your um, production environment because the rate limit was hit. Now, thinking of this, um, one could say, well, we are defining the limit as a, as a service level indicator and the objective should be the pull counts remaining should be 10 or maybe like in a, in a bigger environment, 100 or 1,000 or something like that. Um, and when the SLO is failing, um, we shouldn't even start a deployment because when you're looking at CI CD deployments as a developer and saying, yeah, nothing happens and I don't know what to do, um, this, this shouldn't be needed um, and it's, it can be quite frustrating if, if nothing works. Now, the idea is to define service level objectives. And the thing is like, okay, what is that? And where, where do I start? Like as an SRE, DevOps, DevOps. Um, and one, like it's, we're going into monitoring, we're 
can go into metrics. We are defining keys and tags. We have values. But what's next? And one of the things is like to get started more easily. I found Prometheus and Promkill uh, pretty good, which allows you to really like collect the metrics. You can query the metrics. Um, you can combine certain logical operators with them. And it's, it's an, I would say, a rather easy language to learn. Um, and it's a way to define your server service level objectives and verify they are not violated. The other thing to understand is what are your metric sources? So like typically or classically infrastructure uh, monitoring with memory CPU, you might have an ex a Prometheus exporter on the node or on the pod or on the cluster. Um, for services, specific other Prometheus exporters, when you have a custom application or your application, you might be needed to instrument the code. Now, um, defining the SLO with PromCal can be done in a way of, for example, using alert rules, which are also then triggering alerts. And um, it also allows you to define the errors, basically, which are allowed in the error budget. So when there's a, sp a specific point of like, I'm pinging a service or I'm, I'm using a, a probe um, exporter to verify that something is reachable over time, I really want to ensure that it's 99.9%. .9 and when the SLO is violated, I want to get an alert and the, and the possibility to kind of figure it out via an API or something else. Um, in order to like add that more easily, I've played around with certain things over the years and found that like build a small application, um, build a Docker container or, or just a container image, use CI CD container registry, use the Prometheus operator and Kube Prometheus um, to monitor the application inside the Kubernetes cluster, where the service monitors uh, custom resource definition is super helpful. And then you can get going, inspect the metrics with Prometheus, and in the future with open telemetry, for example. Now, my talk is also about left shifting SLOs. So service level objective, objectives and observability shouldn't be just at the end of, of the DevOps lifecycle, but we want, really want to see the value as developer or when I'm writing code, um, how can I benefit from service level objectives um, similar to, for example, shifting security left. And like one of the ideas was, okay, we are we're using SLOs. Um, we do have Prometheus. We are calculating um, the alerts. We have the promcals, which can also be written in the open SLO format. So this is a new specification, which was defined, I think, last or started last year in May and now reached uh, version.0 last week or something. Um, and using that knowledge, we can deploy it into CI CD um, or use, uh, using uh, environments, doing metrics monitoring. And one of the ideas was to have a certain quality gate, which means something or you're monitoring um, the SLOs with Prometheus and let Captain as an application verify whether the SLO is violated or not. And if it's violated, it blocks the deployment and it never reaches production. Um, Captain itself works as a quality gate, but also like as a, it is more than a quality gate actually. Um, you can do more with like ensuring a specific state is there. It's, I would say it's basically an observability platform for continuous delivery as well. Um, it has a UI where you can test certain things, certain workflows, um, and I would really encourage you to try it out and see whether a quality gate in your CI CD pipeline makes sense to, to measure the SLOs. Um, the thing which came around was like we, I have the quality gate now, and we know how to use um, SLOs with Prometheus. But the problem is like, how could I like uh, simulate a production incident? So like, fail the database, fail uh, fail a connection, fail DNS, see what what is going on, um, and so I can. 
I learned about chaos engineering, like not adding it only to the production environment, but also deploying a staging environment or test environment from a merge request, letting it run for, for some minutes, generate some chaos, and we'll come to that in a bit, um, and then see how the application is behaving. Is it crashing? Um, is there some certain like deadlock or something else? Um, and if I really want to dive into monitoring and collecting metrics, I can also trigger alerts. I can integrate it into merge requests. I can use alerts and incident management and so on. So um, now it's left shifting with chaos. And um, again, where do I start? And on the right-hand side, it's German chaos. Um, found it on the internet, pretty funny. I'm not from Germany, I'm from Austria. Um, sorry about that. Um, the thing is, I started with like Cloud Native Hook, and then we have a cluster with Kubernetes where we can deploy our workloads and deployments and so on. Um, we can use a chaos framework, which defines experiments, and it might be having instrumentation SDKs where I can write my own chaos, my own rules, what should be happening. Um, and I found these like terms to keep in mind really helpful to really keep going and diving deep into the, into the tools, into the frameworks, um, which are also CNCF projects. One of them is Litmus Chaos, which I think I found last year, and we also had the f folks in our Everyone Can Contribute Cafe meetup a while ago. The idea is um, to fail your infrastructure and cluster. Um, you want to see how the application is behaving, like I just said, and see and verify the service, service level objective, if it's really matching, um, and from there, defining the actions and improvements. Um, it provides a nice UI. The getting started guide is awesome. So it's like really like five minutes and then you can get started. And um, there is like the chaos hub with experiments, workflows. The community is, is amazing, like helping each other and adding more things. Um, one doesn't need to invent by yourself, which is a good thing in, in like chaos engineering. Yeah, and I think it's like, I really like the UI. So. Um, this is one of the tools to try out. The other one I found um, at CNCF was Chaos Mesh. Um, I don't know which one is older or younger, um, but it's kind of, it provides the same functionality like Litmus, can run chaos experiments. You can also um, run it just once or schedule it. So like if you say, hey, I wanna introduce chaos in my, in my cluster just for 30 seconds and then every five minutes, which is a different error pattern to just fail at once because the application might survive that and just come back. Um, and then I was thinking, well, DNS might always be the problem and it's, I heard from a friend, it's super interesting when you're turning off DNS in a, in a Java environment, for example, and see what happens. I was like, okay, then maybe we should try that as well. Um, from the UI, Chaos Mesh provides also some sort of previewing and scheduling strategies and whatnot. Um, so I would really encourage you to also try it out. I've, I think it also takes like a couple of minutes to install it using a help chart and um, then starting up the interface and keep going. When I'm thinking or when I thought about like, okay, all the stories I've been telling in uh, previously, how does this match with um, chaos engineering? Um, and like the, for, for an SRE story, it could be CPU overload, um, it could be HTTP requests being blocked, something similar to the golden signals. For my uh, nightmare as a developer with the many API clients, it could just be something which is not closing the TLS connection correctly or just intercepting DNS or something else. For ops, like, okay, again, something around DNS, or it doesn't resolve, or it resolves to some funny IP addresses, or it just provides IPv6 and then see how it behaves. Um, yeah, and um, for like the DevOps story, maybe having a registry or container registry proxy, which does some sort of limiting and rate limiting in there, um, and just seeing how this actually behaves um, and then defining the actions you want to do. When you want to dive deeper into this, 
like your own chaos, there are experiments, SDKs out there, and I think Litmus has Go and Python, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you can integrate it into CI CD. There is a lot of tutorials and document documentation out there. And I think Azure is using Chaos, Chaos Mesh as well. Um, the thing is, um, there are some limits with Chaos or Chaos Engineering because it consumes more resources. Um, it might harm different teams and different workflows, so it might have some impact on the system as well. So um, don't try to enable chaos everywhere and then see everything break. I think this kind of needs some planning and some maintenance and also awareness that this is now being deployed in, in the systems. And the other thing is to keep in mind, it doesn't solve all the re reliability issues, but it can help bring another perspective. Um, in order to really see what is going on and potentially um, fix that in the future. Now the thing is, I thought about my own story with the failing connections and DNS failing and things like that and the memory leak. And so I hacked a quick demo for, which uses a C++ code. Um, it gets deployed to Kubernetes. Um, Kube Prometheus does all the monitoring um, and Chaos Mesh invokes some chaos and there's potential to use SLOs and alerts and so on. Um, and the image on the right-hand side, I generated that with a small tool. Um, yeah, so in this case, what I'm trying now um, as a short demo, um, I have created or written a short application, let me see. The application is actually, um, it's a short C++ code. You don't need to understand everything which is going on in, he in here. The idea is to um, create a buffer, do some DNS resolving, and then error out. When it's successful, it does something, and then it deletes the buffer. So at this specific point, there is a condition missing to delete um, the memory all the time. So I may add the uh, the error is intentionally, of course, for this for this demo now, but it kind of reminded me where I was at. Um, the thing I've prepared already is this application is built uh, in GitLab CI CD as a Docker image, and the manifests have been deployed into Kubernetes already. And I should be navigating over here. And um, you have certain parts in here, and I'm hoping the Wi-Fi, does the Wi-Fi work or does it not? Probably not. Oh, yeah, just, just, just a slight delay. Um, so, the idea is like to, to ping, uh, to do DNS resolving for different domains. And I was just using o11y.love, cncf.io, and gitlab.com. Um, now, when we're inspecting um, the cncf ping, and it works hopefully, yes. So we are getting some results back, and everything is just fine. Um, and hopefully, my terminal doesn't die. The thing I want to do now is inject some or create some chaos in, in the cluster. Um, and in order to do that, we have chaos mesh and um, a scheduled workflow in there. And again, um, this is, uh, can we, I think we cannot edit it, but the main idea is um, to, to create um, a DNS chaos cha as a chaos type and then define the schedule and the domains which I want to track or which I want to fail are o O11y um, with, a, with an asterisk and so on. Um, but the, basically I really want to fail um, DNS. Now on the other side I want to keep track of the memory and this is currently looking good, so it's not consuming that much memory for the, um, 
for the containers, but when we introduce chaos into the containers, we should be seeing the memory going up. And this is the problem with live demos. Hopefully it works. Can click on star, yes, I want to do that. Oh, hmm. it doesn't like it. Okay. Um, then let's do something else. Let's pause this and archive the schedule, create a new schedule. And the cool thing is we can just upload the YAML file and submit it. Now it's being pre-filled and it also runs continuously and let's see, I submit that. And it's now running, okay. Probably should fix the duration of 60 seconds. Um, so I'm impatient, I'm pressing reload. Um, the other thing I wanna verify, okay. Currently it's still resolving. No events found. Hmm. Does the memory change over here? So in, in theory, um, if, if the experiment is starting, it should be looking like this, so at a certain point, the chaos experiment um, kicks in. The DNS, uh, the configuration is set to fail and not random. So you could also like say, hey, random responses to it. And then um, the bug is hitting and I'm seeing the memory going up. And I, to be honest, I didn't have time to add more to this demo now, but it shows um, that you can really detect like a, a program mistake which just happens over time only when DNS is failing. Otherwise, it's, it just works. Um, yeah, and I'm just quickly checking if the live demo doesn't work. Oh, something happened. Oh, yeah, actually nothing is working right now with DNS, at least for the domains and Mm -hmm. Maybe the Wi-Fi is more stable today. At least I hope that. Mm. Maybe. Okay. Um, potentially it's not working, but I will continue. Um, we just pretend it worked. Um, you can try it. So uh, the slides are available on sket.com and everything which is like linked in the slides now you can try out later on. And the repository which is um, at the bottom, everything is documented in there. So this is a public GitLab repository with a readme and a, all the description which I did just for this uh, short demo to show that Chaos Engineer with DNS works. Now, um, when I want to move from like chaos engineering, also looking more into like monitoring to observability, which is like the second thing, um, we just talked a lot about metrics and how you measure them and you're defining the SLOs, but looking into observability, it's much more than that. You might be having logs and events. There is like distributed tracing, continuous profiling, error tracking, uh, RUM agents, uh, real-time user agent, real-time user monitoring agents. Um, yeah, and a certain shift from monolith to microservices. And this is quite a lot to learn as a developer um, and really to understand. It's like take a step back, breathe, and maybe start looking into metrics and tracing um, in the beginning. Um, traces itself are a little like different to logs. It's a span, it's a span with a start and an end time. 
It allows you to um, define metadata in more context. And you can do app code instrumentation. Um, for the specification, probably you've attended open telemetry talks this week already. It's really like coming up. Um, for me, the most important things I learned on the journey with open telemetry is you need to bring your own backend. So whether it being for traces, Jaeger, Elasticsearch, ClickHouse, et, um, and so on. You can build your own distribution, like I think AWS announced the, the metrics. Uh, AWS Hotel distribution as GA today or yesterday. I think Michael Hausenblast tweeted about it. And it allows you to also like use auto instrumentation for specific languages and SDK so you don't need to go deep into your, the, the application code. Um, I think the Java SDK provides that. Another idea is to dive into more into auto instrumentation, auto instrumentation and observability and look into eBPF. Um, which I personally find super interesting. And it would be also interesting whether we could dive into using that as a source for SLOs, but also using it as a source for combining all the da different data we are collecting and signals and events um, and really moving forward with that. I can talk 10 hours about this. So this is the, the call to action to, to navigate to ebpf.io, for example, and check it out. And um, yeah, with that, shifting left or left shift, the thing or what I want you to remember is see the value and observability. So it's also providing an application insight for everyone who's not the developer or the author of the code, um, which allows you to also um, find problems fast. So it's, the, it's like the problem inside the code or is it something else? And also use boring solutions like start with the, the minimal viable change in that regard, like metrics with Prometheus, tracing with open telemetry, and then continue adding more observability data, which you might already have in your environment. The other thing is like when observability is there for everyone, um, you need to teach your teams, you need to do onboarding, probably um, write documentation, how it's being done, how instru app instrumentation works. Defining the service level objectives and the alerts in CI CD, thinking about merge requests with staging environments, um, going deeper into alert channels, incident management, and so on. And from a cloud native perspective, um, it's great to just have like the benefit of the deployments. You can do auto scaling. You can learn from all the CNCF projects now starting to adopt, for example, open telemetry and like getting the best practices directly and getting inspired, so I, I kept looking into how uh, open telemetry is now in Kubernetes, in Prometheus, um, and everywhere else, and potentially we will be seeing much, much more in the future, and we can all learn um, together from, from the amazing open source community. And um, shifting left with chaos, to conclude with that, um, try out the chaos workflows, like the built-in ones, the custom experiments, Verify the SLOs, think of quality gates, think of reliability, and then iterate and innovate. Um, my own personal wish list with regards to observability, chaos, and so on. Maybe we have some machine learning in the future which allows us to correlate events and auto generate the SLOs. Potentially, vendors are already working on that. Um, chaos out of the box, so we don't need to, like, add it on top of it, um, but really have it like on a platform or something like that. Um, and it should be accessible to everyone, not just the developer who gets everything and then burns out from that, but really it should be team effort. And um, yeah, telemet open telemetry being adopted more widely. Um, I started something for myself with CI-CD observability with regards to adding open telemetry into GitLab. Different story, I will be talking at CDCon um, in two weeks, I think, about this topic. Yeah, and just to recap, do app instrumentation with metrics with traces, consider learning from curl and SLOs, evaluate quality gates with Captain and Prometheus, do the shift left, try chaos engineering, and benefit from observability everywhere. Um, yeah, and if you want to learn more about observability, I've started a, a, a small learning platform, o11y.love. It really needs like everyone to contribute. Um, 
but yeah, I really want to like encourage everyone to learn, and I'm also here for you if you have questions around app instrumentation. I'm really, I'm overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed myself, um, but I really want want to encourage everyone. We can learn together and in the open and um, ensure that our systems are running and that observability is fun. Yeah, thanks for your attention. <laughs>